of this name and when I was thinking of a, a name for my company I was throwing around all these ideas and this one just kept on coming back to me so I was like do you know what I'm just gonna do it and it, I put it out there and um, feedback's been pretty good but I hear you it, it's a bit um, elusive right so first of all human because I don't feel like any distinguishing characteristic that we have as, as a race really can separate us from our experiences. Um, we all suffer, we all have joy, we all have pain, we all have trauma, we, we all have happiness and we all wanna connect. Um, and we all have our struggles in achieving those things. So it's a human experience that I deal with. It's not just, just for women or just for men or just for children or just for whatever. Right. It's mm -hmm. humans, right? Right, um, right. So, and the intentionality part of it is that I have worked for, since I was probably 19, in the helping professions, right? So before I became a therapist, I was a social worker and I saw pain everywhere. And I saw people being stuck in their belief that this was all that there was because it's all those they've ever known. It's all their yeah. family have ever shown them. Mm -hmm. um, and life outside their window doesn't really give them much hope that things can change. So they just accept life as is and they accept their suffering and that's it. They live forever in the way that they are. Right. And I think that that has always driven me insane. And, and, and my passion has always been to teach people that you have choice, you have control over your life, over your experiences. If you choose to take up that challenge and you wanna do the work, yeah. And you can live intentionally and choose how you respond to the world around you. It changes your lived experience of life. That that's so that's why the intentional human. I I, I think we're done. That was so good. I think <laughs> that was absolutely this is what I wanted. That was awesome. That was a beautiful way to describe exactly why I found you fascinating and wanted to do a show with you. Um, but we're gonna dig deeper into what you just said by looking at right i'm rewiring the thoughts yeah now, now the first one we uh, did together uh the zoom live uh was regulating the body yeah okay so this one deals uh with the thoughts why the separation again for those who may have not seen the first one yeah so I have a program that I have put together for all of my years of um, private practice where I realized I was really following this system of helping people live intentionally to heal their trauma. So what I had done is I really defined it into a program and it has three levels to it. So the first level is learning how to connect to your body and then regulate your body because quite often trauma survivors have that high like arousal response, like a high stress response, which sends us okay. into fight, flight or freeze. And that really limits the way we choose to respond in the moment. So that's why, first of all, we have to manage our body, right? Um, in the moment when we're triggered, when, when we have those reactions to life. The second stage, which becomes a little bit more deeper, it, it, it involves a lot more thinking, is actually how you reframe the way you see the world and then how that has that knock-on effect onto your body as well. So it's about that mind-body connection. But you've got to do the first bit first. Because the next bit can be triggering in and of itself. This work can be provocative. And if something we talk about for people when they're doing this work becomes stressful, they need to learn on, lean on the skills they learn in level one. So you're saying the rewiring part in itself can prove to be something stressful. Mm. um emotionally mentally or even physically yeah, it course, all can. All like even even when you reconnect to your body when you first start paying attention to what your body's doing that can be really stressful for people who have switched off from their body for years same thing goes for your worldview it, it we, we hold on to our worldview it's part of our belief system it's part of our identity and a lot of the work I do challenges that so you people if they want to work with me they have to be ready to challenge that because if you come in and, and your challenge your worldview is challenged that can be really shaky and, and that can make you feel quite vulnerable and can trigger some feelings of being unsafe, i.e. a stress response or trauma reaction. Yeah. When, when we're looking at that expression, worldview, our, our worldview, mm -hmm. and it, uh, of course, our worldview is something that is governed, as it were, by our thoughts. Is that way I'm understanding you correctly? We can, our worldview can be shaped or reshaped by our thoughts or no? Yeah, so I guess I, I look at it in two ways. So I have, we have our brain 
Mm, let me think about how to explain this. So the way we think impacts the way we feel. I think that's typically a known thing. I mean, I can, I'm going to talk about why and how in a minute, but mm. when we think a certain way, we know we feel a certain way. Um, our brain becomes programmed by our lived experiences today, right? So it learns okay. what kept us safe, what made us yeah. feel good, what made us feel bad, what we want to repeat, what we don't want to repeat, and how to mm -hmm. make that happen. That, that's typically how our brain gets programmed. Well, what continues that programming is once we're aware of that and we understand that the way we think impacts our, our, our body and our lived experience, what impacts that is then how we choose to see the world the thoughts that we have that we keep telling ourselves so let me take it back let me talk about the mind body connection because i think that needs to happen first really to make sense of what i just said so there is this nerve i touched on it in the last segment called the mm -hmm. vagus nerve and it runs from the base of the skull throughout all your major organs through to the bottom of your body i think it sits in the bottom of your torso sorry that your, your sit bone on your gut is probably the lowest part and we didn't know about this nerve until very recently it's just part of one of those things that science gets really excited about when they find something new mm -hmm. and we realized that the way that our brain operates has a direct link to all of our major organs in our body so if our brain is stressed our brain is sending a stress response to our whole body through this nerve mm -hmm. and the way that our body responds to that is the autonomic nervous system so basically it's the automatic think of it that way it's the automatic nervous system we don't have any control over the way our body responds in the moment we can calm it right but in the moment that initial response our body just does that automatically but it's guided by our brain's interpretation of the world and that interpretation of the world has been programmed by our experiences and continues to be programmed by our thoughts. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes sense. I appreciate you breaking that down. So we're, we're really examining in the first step of the mind-body connection, how, it, how those stress signals are sent through the body. I mean, they're going to be sent through the body. We're going to get them. But well, the, let's, play, let's play a game, right? Let's do a little test perfect. before we move on. There's a thing called the lemon test, and it's the best example of how to show what I'm talking about. Okay, so you're going to do it with me, all right? Mm -hmm. So I want you to imagine, hold out your hand in front of you, and I want you to imagine that you're holding a lemon in your hand. Okay, you need to feel the weight of that lemon. Mm -hmm. You need to feel its kind of sticky, waxy texture, its coolness, it. mm -hmm. right? And I need to imagine that you're popping it on a, on a cutting board, you get a knife, and you're going to cut it open. Okay. And as you're cutting it open, the smell hits your nose mm -hmm. and you can see the juice running out of the lemon and the spray in the air as you cut it. Mm -hmm. I need to pick the half lemon up in your hand. Okay. And if you want to close your eyes, it can help, but hold that lemon right up to your face and to really smell that really strong citrus, mm -hmm. sweet smell. And now I want you to imagine that you are going to take a big bite out of that lemon, just shove it in your face and just go, big bite. And all the juice from the lemon is running into your mouth and that citrus burny feeling is running through your cheeks. It. it makes your face squirm. It, it squirms when you said bite. So is your mouth full of saliva right now? Um, well, yeah, I made it that way because of you. You did right. that with the lemon. So what did we just learn here? You scared me. Do you, have, that, do you have powers from way over where you are? <laughs> <laughs> you just scared me. Okay, no, but my brain, right? Yeah. Told my body it was there because you yeah. fed it that information. Is that kind of, yeah. did I get there? Well, well, typically you fed it that information. I was given the instruction, but you did it, right? You, you, you didn't have to do what I was saying. You followed along because I asked you to. I see you what you're on, saying. Right? I got you. You gave right. the command to your brain. I'm holding a lemon right now. I'm cutting a lemon right now. I can smell a lemon right now. I can taste the lemon right now. And your brain said, okay. There's a lemon. So I know I to get your body ready to eat a lemon. I gave so my you? brain the command to do it, but yeah. you gave me the instruction. That's yeah. like priceless what you just said. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm processing what you did. That was, you gave me the instruction. I in turn 
gave my brain the command and therefore I went with it from there, correct? Yeah. My body responded to those steps. Yeah, and your right. whole body responded, not just your mouth. Okay. You felt it saying. in your hand, right? Yes, I know. I, I got, yeah. Right? And what's really important to know about this is that you now have a memory file of that one time you were talking to me and you ate a lemon, mm -hmm. right? But you yep. didn't eat a lemon, but your body believes that you did. Got it right? So you had a whole body experience. Your, every part of your being mm -hmm. believed, even if it was just for some small moments during that little exercise, that there was genuinely a lemon in your hand and you were eating it. Okay. So your body now has this lived experience of that time you ate a lemon with me. I'll never now, be this. I'll never be the same. You just, some you, people, just you gave on. the instruction. I took the command and gave it to my brain, which in turn sent it's doing its job, doing its naturally, uh, as it were, uh, created designed way to work. It's telling the rest of my body, uh, we in we're in limit mode here. We're, we're having a limit. And it responded to that command. Does its job. Amazing. Now, if you imagine all of the thoughts you have throughout the day, and what messages you're sending to your body throughout the day. Mm -hmm. What is your body being prepared for? What does your body believe is happening? Because of the thoughts that you are sending to your brain, mm -hmm. that are, your brain doesn't know what's real and what's imagined. We just proved that, right? Correct, right. It's going to go based upon whatever we tell what it. We tell it. We, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to use your words, whatever we command it. So we have to be careful what instructions we're taking in yeah. and absorbing as true. And it could be literally not true. I'm sorry, go and ahead. You were saying? Than, no, more often than not, it's not true. Because quite often we're stuck in the past or we're stuck in the future. So we're either reliving that argument we had with that person in high school or that time the bus driver wouldn't let us on because we didn't have the right money, or that time oh. that our, our dad screamed at us, or that time our brother chased us around the garden and we were really scared, or, or it was funny, or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever thought pops into our mind, and they can be the most innocuous thoughts initially, mm -hmm. but when we go down that rabbit hole, they tend to go someplace quite, with quite an extreme emotional response. Okay. Have you ever done that, Paxton? Have I had like a memory come up, and then before you know oh, it, you're without, talking yeah. about... 20 mm -hmm. years previously and that really terrible thing that happened i hate to say this but this is so weird you asked me that right now i'm thinking about when we did the igtv live show together and we worked with the audience and now you're bringing this information out and literally emotionally i was thinking man i wish we could redo that again and you could say what you just said right now because so many people would have benefited from that in the moment yeah. i'm sorry i know you were thinking probably of something else but I'm just, that's immediately what i thought of before you even asked me that question, that was just funny. Well, you just, that. Well, you just that, I thought of that moment and I went like, I connected the two moments. Anyhow, go ahead. You were saying, go ahead. But that, that passion that you have to share this information is what I have. Cause it's like, people need to know this. People yeah. need to hear this. Cause it's yeah. really, it's, it's kind of simple, but it's kind of deep and it's so powerful. And it's, if quite, it's quite profound. Go ahead. You were saying. Yeah. So basically i guess so we've made that we've made that awareness that we have a connection between the way we think and the way we feel we've also had this realization that we have a degree of control over that and that we quite often i'm going to say misuse that control unintentionally unknowingly because until you have an awareness of this stuff it's all done subconsciously we all just live in we're all just plodding along and before we know it we spend our whole day stressed and it's because we have Dotted between okay I've got this job to do my report's late that person over there hasn't spoken to me for three hours I wonder if they're mad at me um maybe it's because I took all the milk out the fridge this morning or you know my kid was shouting at him this morning and I shouted back and I really wish I hadn't oh my god my husband's gonna moan at me because I don't know what we're gonna do for dinner or whatever your thought process is whatever life looks like for you you're gonna have this version of like an internal monologue of the way you talk to yourself now, when it's about life, like, okay, I've got so much to do, blah, 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 it can feel mm -hmm. quite manageable, right? It's stressful, but it can feel quite manageable. And I think it's a day-to-day -day thing that we all live with. Right. Problem comes when it becomes about us. So we are talking to us about us. 
and it's all bad, right? We effectively, we are hating on ourselves. So our thoughts have power and we need to use it properly. You just said sometimes we misuse it, right? Yeah. And we're talking, we're not just saying things to ourselves. Sometimes you're saying we talk about ourselves. To to ourselves. Are you, oh, are, you, are you trying are you trying to blow my mind right now because you already do that you know just period so you seriously that is like <laughs> okay sometimes we get excited when people talk about us or talk to us a certain way but we can be the number one culprit of leading the leading the tribe you know leading the bandwagon of talking to ourselves in a bad way or about ourselves in a bad way based upon what you're saying yep and if you was to put all of the thoughts you have throughout the day into two different bags, right? And place them on a scale. And one is positive thoughts about yourself and the world. And one is negative thoughts about yourself and the world. Trauma or not, most people, because of the way that the world is, I don't know why, I'm not that deep, will have more in the negative than they will in the positive. I think unless you're particularly, you've done work on being grateful, you meditate, you've really connected to yourself and the world and the universe and you know your place within it and you can see the world in a very bright way, which is a lot of the work I do as well. I think we get stuck in this life's hard, everybody hates me, I'm an idiot kind of mode. Say, say, say those again one more time. I don't know what I said. Life's hard. I'm an idiot. Everyone hates me and I'm hates an idiot. Me. Is that what I yeah. said? <laughs> That's what you said. Keep Life's talking hard, everyone to... hates me and I'm an idiot. That yeah. might be the title of this segment. So let's go with it. <laughs> Life's hard, everyone hates me and I'm an idiot. Now imagine if that's the case for you, for so mm-hmm. you and anyone who's listening to this, if mm-hmm. you're if your pot of negative thoughts is way heavier than your pot of positive thoughts, how do you think that shapes your lived experience? When I say lived experience, I'm talking about your full body experience of any given moment, okay? Okay. So like with the lemon, you had a lived experience now of of eating a lemon. If -hmm. if you come to the end of your day and you weigh up your thoughts throughout the day and you're like, do you know what? I'm like 80% negative today. My lived experience of today was that life is hard everyone hates me and I'm an idiot because that's the belief that you're reinforcing through the way that we are choosing to frame everything see the world in that way and and to a measured degree with all due respect to anyone that may feel that we could a person could spend a great deal of time trying to chase down how it got started and not really work on the ability to start to rewire their thoughts I'm just Mm. wondering Uh, that's true that is true. And I'll come to that in a minute because I think it kind of okay. leads on to something else that I want to talk about. But absolutely, we do get stuck in this like disempowered loop. Yeah, right. Yeah, 100%. Um, so basically, our past experiences plus our thoughts about life today, they create our lived experience of the world and our place in it. Mm-hmm. When we aren't aware of that, that we are in default past programming mode. And we are going to continue to repeat those patterns of behavior until something snaps us out of it. Now, for a lot of people, it is having some big thing happen. A loved one dying, a relationship ending, a a, a career pivoting or or ending, whatever. Something that's really made you take stock. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's those moments when, when you're forced to face reality that you then get that questioning start that you've just described. You know, well... Well, if this is always happening to me, common denominator here is me, we can fall into the loop of, okay, so that means I I am, it is all my fault, right? Yeah, I am stupid yeah. and everybody does hate me and I yeah. am an idiot because it's, I'm the common denominator. It, it always it's, yeah, to me. right, right. right? It, and that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> no, oh, good right. gosh, no. By all but, means, yeah. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this. I love this doctor, um, Daniel Amen. Have you heard of him? Yeah, a little short guy with bald head. But. Yeah, I don't know how. I don't know if he's short. I haven't really noticed him standing. But yes, this is an American doctor. I think he's um, I think he's uh, over yeah. here, actually. I think he's over in the. Um, you're he's in California. Uh, he's uh, not that. Uh, yeah, he's here somewhere in California. I, this is how strange this is. I literally was going to post something that he that that uh, today before yeah. we uh, did this today about an hour ago. 
I was going to post something from him, but please go ahead. This is just amazing. So you he just has mentioned a couple that. of um, one-liners, which I'm just, I, I adore. He's so great. And any, if anyone okay. who loves this work will just adore him, but his is don't believe every stupid thing you think. And that might have even been the thing you were going to post. I don't know. But um, uh, no, very, very similar in thought. But uh, I may have to change the title of this segment to that now. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, really. That's a very valid point. And so many people can get caught up in this, as you said, a little loop of thinking uh, that way about themselves. Uh, please. And, and it becomes automatic because it's our programming. And mm -hmm. it's automatic. He calls them automatic negative thoughts. So ants right? He calls them your ants and they crawl all over you and irritate you. Yeah, <laughs> and yes, that, it's, yeah. it's a perfect analogy because it's exactly what they do. So I work with negative thoughts in a very similar way. Um, okay. I, I've been doing this before I found him, but when I found him, it just compounded and added to how I do this work. He's, he's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and why it's so hard to change, right? Why is it so hard to change? Well, first of all, because if you're not aware, you can't change. If you don't know what's broken, you can't fix it. So there's that, all right? And then okay. there's also, once you become aware, you're then faced with the decision to change. Who wants to do that? No one ever, not unless you really feel like you have to. And there's this famous quote out there, which is something like, um, you only ever change when the power or the, the pain of not changing becomes greater than the pain of change. Something like that. I'm probably murdered that, but I think it has great emphasis here because when we're when where we are becomes so painful that's when we're like do you know what I'd, i'll take anything over this even if it's going to be painful I'm, I'm i'm in let's go if i have to revamp my whole identity and worldview let's do it if i have to shatter every belief i have let's go trouble is we might think that in this part of our brain and we talked about this before right we have different segments of the brain mm -hmm. but when we get stressed our access to the, to the logical, thoughtful, deep part of our brain, gone, our IQ drops. So when we might say this really comfortably now, oh, I agree, I'm gonna change, right? It's all those people that say, I'm gonna go on a diet, I'm gonna quit smoking. I agree there's something that needs to change and I'm gonna do the work to change it. And then it's 6 a.m. in the morning and your onion chairs are there and you're like, oh, I said I was gonna do that thing. I'm gonna go for a run. Oh, I don't, I don't wanna go. And you'll lay in bed and you'll think of every reason why it's okay for you to not run. And what I think people give themselves a really hard time for is, well, this means I'm weak. This means I have no resilience. I'm, I have no willpower. I can't see things through. This then reinforces this negative belief that I already have on myself, which is that mm. you know, life yeah. is hard. Yeah. Everybody hates me and I'm stupid. Um, what people I think need to understand, what would be so good for people to understand is that you have a mechanism in your subconscious, which is designed to keep you alive does not care if you're happy. Well, that is a massive distinction to make. Your brain does not care if you are happy. It cares that you are alive. It cares that it's in the environment that it gets you into. It knows and it can manage it, i.e. it can survive it. Mm -hmm. So if you have a trauma background, that part of your brain, that instinct to want to maintain the status quo mm -hmm. is so finely tuned. And your brain, like a radio, is tuned into that alarm system. So anything new, your subconscious literally says to you, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Are you crazy? If we do that, I don't know what's going to happen and I can't keep you safe. You could die because I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So please don't do that. Please just stay in bed because here I know what's going to happen. Yes, you're, you know, you're overweight and you're, you've got diabetes, but at least I know what to do with this. Yeah. New is scary, unknown, unpredictable. Known is safe, manageable, predictable, i.e. survivable. And that is all your brain cares about, quite literally, um, particularly for trauma survivors, because that survival instinct is already activated almost all of the time. So they live in that state of any idea that's going to challenge me and cause me to change any element of my life or my worldview is too scary. So the idea that I say to a trauma survivor, hey, how about instead of feeling helpless, you could feel empowered to do something different with your life. <gasps> like, it's just like this stifling feeling of, well, first of all, you're attacking me because you're blaming me now for how I am. And secondly, um, I can't do that. So this insecurity comes up of this self-belief. They don't have 
a self-belief system in place. They didn't get it from their childhood that they can overcome problems. So the notion that someone, some therapist turns up and says, hey, you know, you can do something about this if you want. They're like, that's really? foreign. That's foreign to them. It's not something acceptable for them to even process no. or put into play in their life. So then how does how does a person move away from that? I'm jumping ahead. Go ahead. No, that's okay. So, um, <laughs> I'm it, sitting there thinking about that. How does a person then, when they hear that, they can't really see that being the case. What did you say? They can't, they didn't learn how to, how to solve problems. They don't have a belief that they can problem solve, that they can okay. overcome right. that's what problems. It was. Yeah, they, okay. don't, they don't have that belief because it's not a lived experience for them. They have never successfully overcome a problem and been praised for it and helped understand that that's what they did. They quite often were felt to have always been the problem. Mm. So it, you, those things aren't, they don't come together well, right? Yeah. In, in adulthood, you can make sense of your child and say, do you know what? I actually survived that bloody well. And I think I'm amazing. I can't believe I got through what I got through. But that's an adult perspective of a child experience. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this comes into the next thing. I'm going to use my board. Yay! Um, it's, board, it's board time. There is a, a yes. psychological framework called mm -hmm. transactional analysis. It talks about roles that we fall into in relationships, in situations. And those roles are, which I think where I'm writing, so we've got child, adult, and parent can you see that okay okay i have a question i can yeah. see it it's, it's exceptionally perfect uh now you're gonna be writing from is there any way to move it closer to the edge of the board and further away from you it's in here yeah is yeah. there any way you could write it there okay now i get to ask a question while you're doing that mm -hmm. um when did you decide to use a dry erase board or visuals? Was that always a part of your life, even as a child? Were you always a visual descriptive person? Yeah, I'm um, a part of my survival. My trauma response to my childhood was to retreat into here, right? It's a really common yeah. one. When the world outside is too unpredictable and scary, we go in here. So I got really, really good at creating a really awesome internal world. Um, and that's where I lived and for a, a huge part of my childhood. and. It's awesome for me. So it's such a wonderful survival skill that I now embrace because my creativity is highly visual and my imagination is highly tuned. So I see things very visually and I explain things very visually. Um, and I also think having both verbal and visual can be really good for people who can't hear clearly sometimes. They need the visual to help. And I'm a bit like that too. If someone just talks at me, I can engage, but once it's done, it's gone. Whereas if I have a visual cut off and that really imprints in my mind. So I like to use them. So, um, that's amazing to find that out about you. It's, it's very amazing. It makes for, um, I'm thinking of my audience and things that they said after your uh, show uh, on the Instagram, uh, Narc Abuse TV uh, page. Um, they were, many of them um, got both sides of you when you faced the camera and spoke, uh, they picked up on a number of things, but when you went to the board, you expounded even more in a very uh, a very unique and different way that many of them had experienced. Because some people are not uh, have not had the experience to, to maybe have someone with a dry erase board explain as you did then or even now and in our, our previous uh, um, recorded, uh, recorded Zoom Live. So, you give people an opportunity to really learn something with their eyes mm -hmm. uh, instead of just, well, most of their life, having somebody just tell them something and you're, you're able to help. You, you helped a lot of people then, and I hope this will be the case here. We're talking about the child. Would you say the adult and then the parent? I'm sorry. What did you say again? Yeah. So it's called transactional analysis and it's, it's a theory around the roles that we fall into or the roles that we adopt in certain relationships in our lives. But I, when I learned about this years ago, um, I kind of parked it. And then I realized when I started doing my trauma therapy that a lot of us fall into child role. 
a lot of trauma survivors fall into child role. Okay. Um, they actually fall into parent role a lot too. So they're often the nurturer, the caretaker. Um, and for other people, they are the everything, right? They are the keepers of all knowledge of all, like every date, every birthday, every dinner, every item of clothing in the house, every whatever, that like they are the keeper of all that knowledge. They become so able and capable to parent everyone around them. And look- Is that what the P is? Is that what the P is for? So that's parent, adult, child. Yeah, I can write that. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. You were gonna say. Um, problem comes is that for ourselves, trauma survivors typically sit in child mode. Oh, okay, got it. Okay, so we, we don't stay in one role all the time in every situation. We all move in and out of all these different roles. Um, no one has ever really talked about, at least, look, I haven't seen it anywhere, transactional analysis in relation to trauma. Um, so this, I love using this model because it's, it's just so helpful to understand and it's not something that you're going to get anywhere else. So I, I love using it. Um, so the parent is the caretaker, right? And a lot of trauma survivors become caretakers in their relationships. They're the friend that never says no. You need to move, they're there. You know, you've, you've run out of eggs, they're there. You, you've had a breakup, they're there. Like whatever the problem, no matter what they've got going on, it's irrelevant because they're in parent mode. When you're in parent mode, you do anything for your kids, right? Yeah. Nothing's more important. If your kid needs you, you're there. And that's the urgency that trauma survivors have in parent mode. And that is a learned role. They learn that role because if you are felt to be a burden as a child, if you're felt to be the problem, if your parents were screaming at you because of something you are doing, a need that you have, you're crying, you're screaming, and, and you become the problem, in order to survive that dynamic and get any amount of love and nurture from that environment, you need to change. Because what you're doing isn't working for you. So mm -hmm. what kids tend to do is they become the problem solver, the people pleaser. That's an apparent role? So as a kid, they will oh, flip sorry. into a parent role. Yeah, so I'm saying as a kid, they develop this role really, really well. Um, and parent for trauma survivors often looks like people pleaser. Okay. Really poor boundaries. Just poor saying boundaries. yes, everyone. right? Problem solver too still? They're still in that mode yeah, of being 100%. a problem solver? Okay, I'm just checking. Okay, all right. Yeah, so it's literally like, describe it like your kid comes to you with a problem mm -hmm. and you're the parent. A typical right. response of a loving parent is, I want to fix this for you. I'm here. You've got me. Let's mm -hmm. do this. Mm -hmm. Right? I'll do anything. I want to drop everything, and I'm going to be here for you. That's fine if you're a parent talking to your child, and that's the way you want to show up for your kids. Awesome. Without, right, without a doubt. But if you're Problem a child. <laughs> yeah, if you're I'm a sorry, child. Man. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, back, you're absolutely yeah. right. If you're a child in your home environment with your parents, and you feel you have to fulfill that role, yeah, in order that's... to appease your parents to keep them calm to stop mm -hmm. them from hitting you from screaming at you shouting at you or your siblings right yeah. you become even more of a parent more if you've got to protect siblings um even if it's like the absence of so even if it's not overt neglect because i often talk about um the big t little t traumas right and quite often people can't identify with having gone through trauma because nothing terrible happened to them but they still feel like this and it's because it's little t trauma it's the way the drip drip effect of a parenting style which on the outside looks fine but the lived experience of that kid is unseen unheard unvalidated so they're belittled demeaned brushed off um, and i often use the example of kid falls over they cut themselves if that kid having a need feels like a burden to that parent mm -hmm. that kid's gonna know and like i said if it's okay if that's just a one-off. If it's the third time they've fallen over in five minutes at the park and you, the, the mom goes, kid, go away, you're fine, go play, that's yeah. fine. But if the response a kid gets when they have any need, they're not allowed to cry because crying is just not accepted. Mm -hmm. um, right. and it, it, could be that, it could be that the response is quite calm, right? It could be that the response isn't shut up, don't cry, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't have so to the be. The response from the parent, you mean, to the yeah. child could be calm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah right so it doesn't seem like it's bad or or, wrong, or, or, it, or it could it could it could be side side shots uh to the child uh, to belittle them 
or, or put them with the rest of the siblings to belittle them for showing that emotion. It, yep. In other words, it could look normal, like you said, on the outside. Yeah. But the lived experience could be, well, very painful emotionally or, yeah. or tra traumatizing. And like if that parent's emotional capacity is very small, so they can't handle your emotions because they can't handle theirs, they actually are going to be unable to co-regulate with you. Do you remember we talked about that in the first one, about okay. how parents show up for kids, how the, their babies are held, kids are held, partners are held, right? When, when we need to have that assistance, when we're overwhelmed, we go to a loved one to hold us. If as a kid, you weren't held very much because your parent actually couldn't do that, yeah, right, right. That's, on them, right? That, that's they've got their own stuff to go through and, and they weren't ready to have kids and they they didn't exactly do it, whatever, right. right? But it doesn't take away from the impact. It could be that like you were raised really strict and you know, boys don't cry and mm -hmm. girls have to do this and boys have to do that. And yeah, right, right. you don't know what you're doing, let me do it for you. You don't know what you're doing, you're doing it wrong, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. If that's the message you get every day, you're an adult who doesn't believe they know what they're doing, they have no confidence. There, there is no I, trust, there is no trust in that in their judgment. They don't have any trust in their own ability to problem solve. Uh, they, they need to always check with someone else to make sure they're doing it the right way or did they do it the right way and second guess something that they did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So if you're an adult and you feel like a problem in the world has come to you, right? So you're just going through life and say you've got a deadline and you've got an angry boss, right? Just because that's a really yeah. common scenario. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Your stress comes up. And your default is to fall here. Okay, so we're here. We're in child mode. Because now we feel like that helpless child who couldn't get it right, who always got screamed at, who couldn't ask for help, who only really knows how to problem solve to keep other people calm, but doesn't really know how to manage themselves. So they do what kids do. They say, I don't know what I'm doing. And they look outside of themselves mm -hmm. for support and validation. Right. Which is normal for a kid, right? If, especially if you never got it, you never move through that phase of development. So you're kind of stuck there. So as an adult, you go into, and this can look like, and I don't like the term, but victim mode, victim mentality. Mm -hmm. um, because if you stay there too long, you have a helplessness about you that other people don't like. It's too triggering for other people. Um, and what's really important is when you're in child mode and you've got a loved one or even a friend and sometimes even a colleague, the default that we do as human beings, when someone in our vicinity turns into child mode, we go into parent mode. Mm -hmm. Just automatically. Like imagine like if you, you're in an office space and someone starts crying. Everyone's going to have a different response to that due to their own programming, but most people are going to have a sense of, oh God, I hope she's okay, or he's okay, or I hope, I hope everything's all right. I wonder if I can help in any way, which is a caring, nurturing side of us that comes out. That's parent role. If you have a friend or a partner that is constantly helpless, feeling like they have no autonomy, no say, no control over the world, they're constantly hurt wounded and overwhelmed by this feeling of the brutal world that we live in because they're stuck without this awareness of the control that they have they're in the past program the reliving past programming the people around them in parent role they, they get really frustrated and really resentful because they also have needs and they want to come into child mode every now and then and they want you to go into parent mode it's the nature of that relationship right let's give that give and take Mm -hmm. there's times when I come home really stressed and I want a hug from my husband mm -hmm. I want to just I don't, I don't want to make dinner I don't want to put the kids to bed and I say I want to give up tonight can you just do it mm -hmm. sometimes he says yes and sometimes he says no but sometimes mm -hmm. he comes home and he's like I can't tonight I'm really sorry C can you take over can I just have a hug I need to, I need five minutes or whatever and it's mm -hmm. that dynamic of Absolutely. we all come into child mode we all do and it's natural if you're in a safe relationship and you can actually become quite vulnerable and give up that power and say I need you to look after me right now because I need some support mm -hmm. that's wonderful right and there's a there's a part when this happens where you kind of both level out into adult if it's done well mm -hmm. okay um trouble is when we live here the trauma survivors who are stuck without an awareness of what's happening for them often live here 
because they never learned that they could do anything to overcome their situation. When you they say, no, please, by all means, you were going to finish. What were you saying? I don't know now. It's right. Go on. You go. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. You're way younger than me. You can't forget stuff. I forget stuff. Okay. So does, does anybody that can get stuck live in child mode? Can they ever see that they are in child mode and decide they don't want to leave it? Um, I think, like I said, it takes something to happen. Quite often loved ones don't know how to express their resentment and frustration for always having to be in parent mode in this relationship. So it comes out quite negative quite often because um, they don't understand what's happening either, right? Um, you mean the person in parent role can come yeah. across uh, upset, um, frustrated because they're what dealing the or they're their partner, the resentment, okay. Because yeah. this person that they're with seemingly or maybe is just constantly in child mode. So you're yeah. saying that they the the person their partner can get upset is what you're saying, yeah, or or their friend or whatever maybe, because nobody wants to live in any particular role all the time. We all our, our needs fluctuate. Okay. So if we we're, we're put into we feel like we're put into parent mode to take care of a partner who's constantly in child mode, the parent role feels very resentful. It still loves and cares for this person, but their resentment is right. building. They don't know what's going on either. All okay, they so know is their needs aren't being met. Okay, so at the same time, okay, if a person's in child mode and they're living there, um, they can get frustrated because someone's telling them that they need to be responsible or step up and take care of responsibilities. And they're accustomed maybe from one relationship to another being in child mode and everybody just yeah. kind of treats them that way. Yeah. And so that's really frustrating if somebody is in parent role and they're in a relationship because now <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself here. So then that's really frustrating because the, the person in the parent role is sitting there going like, I'm doing everything. Yeah. And they have to, I can see the resentment coming in, but they never get to have a hug. Yeah. <laughs> they never get to have a day off from doing yeah something else because they have to constantly be thinking for everyone else instead of having someone uh working to work with them as a team yeah and that's it wow. it's teamwork because teamwork happens here this the balance of this the dance of this is teamwork right but the, the goal is you both meet here oh i see what you're saying so because each individual has a different measure of child or parent uh, fluctuation that they're going to do but the key is, is to come together and recognize that and okay. have, yeah, work together as a team. And that makes them two responsible, accountable adults that work together yeah. and, and build together. Okay. A great point. I'm sorry. I was just, I'm observing. No, all okay. that. No, I'm, cool. having, I'm having a guy moment. I'm breaking it down. Go ahead. No, you're good. It's good. Girls have questions too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, We're easily confused, but go ahead. <laughs> So the question you asked, and I get this a lot as well, you know, and I get a lot of partners come to me saying, I, I've had a bad time too, but my partner's in a worse state and I never seem to be able to get them to sh snap out of it, just to, to step up. Um, what, what happens then is the way that partner shows up to the person in child mode becomes reinforcing of their own self view, which is that they're helpless. Yeah. Like disempowered, <laughs> can't do anything right. So, it. Yes, it right. Just, so it just compounds it. So the thing is, and it, this is the tricky bit, is that you can't force anyone else to change. Nobody can. We only have control over ourselves. But what we can do is we can change ourselves and then that impacts our relationships. So I do a lot of work with partners around how they can shape up and step up in their own way, how they can model adult mode to their partner. But ultimately, the individual has to come to that realization when they're ready. And look, this isn't necessarily no, no pressure. Fun. They can't pressure someone to do something no. when they're not ready, let alone if they don't want to. But they may want to, but they're just not ready. Also, it, it, yeah. if I understand you correctly. And like I said earlier, it's scary. So that they're like they might be okay. starting to get that realization. You know, the cycle of change. Mm -hmm. If anyone's ever studied that, you might have an idea that there's a problem. 
and you're starting to consider that maybe that you should do something about it, but you're not quite there yet. So, you know, this isn't a relationship segment, but, you know, if that is you, then that's a conversation you have to have within your relationship. How long is this going to go on for? Who knows? And are you willing to hang around? That's up to you, you know? Um, but ultimately, that individual needs something to shift for them so that pushes them to make a change. And not all shifts do that, right? We can't predict it. We can't be like, okay, I'll leave them and just hopefully be, then they'll realize. Just because they had a shift or we're going to try to create a shift, you can't doesn't mean you're gonna get a shift <laughs> and it might not be yeah. in the direction you want either oh, they that, might go further good down, point. Yeah, right yeah, good point yeah because their self-belief is so low that they actually can't even see that they're like oh now another person's left me cool you've reinforced my worldview that i'm yeah, i'm yeah, unworthy of love yeah. here right so there's that too so look if you're I, I and you can't i can't work with people who aren't ready to change so this model that i'm presenting to you today is for people who are like look i I'm, i see it let's go yeah right right so the questions then i have i call them my two magic questions and they wait, are wait. how many two okay i'm not used to you just only having a couple of things you normally have more than that but okay so two magic questions oh wait oh sorry you're gonna write i thought you're gonna okay, race. Go on. no i thought you were gonna race so i just want to make sure so when people watch this back i'll make sure i'm also I'm making sure that i get it right the person that is in i'm gonna start with the adult the adult role is more teamwork oriented, yeah. more balanced. Okay. Quite logical, okay. quite emotionally rational, very okay. level. And that's the goal for most humans. <laughs> most humans, yes. It's most humans. Not, most, no. most, most chimpanzees, that's not exactly what they're looking for, or, or <laughs> monkeys. Okay, so parent, the parent role is a person who essentially is a nurturer, problem solver kind of a thing, which is yeah. that okay? that's okay and then the extreme becomes people pleaser with no boundaries okay and a people pleaser with no boundaries now that is not the case with a person who is a quote-unquote most of the time trauma survivor they're stuck as it were in the child mode which means or no correct so, me. yeah so yeah so it's two so you know i said how we don't stay in one role all the time in all the situations so quite often trauma survivors are up here in parent role with other people so at work, they are smashing it. In relationships like friendships, they show up. Um, they are goal orientated. They are. They want the world to see them as an achiever because they never got that recognition as a kid. So a uh, lot of the time, it's not the only response you can have from trauma, but it's a really common one. So they go into this overachieving, um, and they might not be overachieving externally, as in like the world might not necessarily look at your life and go, wow, you've really achieved, but they might be overachieving just in their own, in their own network. So they might just be like, I'm really, I'm going to make sure I'm a really good nan. No, I didn't, you know, I might got to point where I'm now a nan and I actually. You, you do know that I'm in the States, right? We have no idea what a nan is. Most of us. A who granny? Are... What do you call it? Oh, you can make a, you can make a face like you. I'm just saying. Most what are you, people, grandma? I, what do you I, I know what it is. I know what it is, but I'm just saying. <laughs> no, mo most of them are called Yoda, actually. They're just called Yoda. Baby Yoda's. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, um, grandma, nanny, you know. Okay. I'll, I'll believe I No, no, I'm just, that's not the, Nan, I just wanted to clear that up. So if anybody watched this, and they were like, what's a Nan? Okay, so nan. we got that. We're talking about. Nanny, but, but not, yes. not your babysitter, Nanny. Like, oh God, it's been, isn't it? All right, yeah. anyway, you get what just, I mean. I get what you mean. Anybody wants to find out more, just DM uh, Leanne and you, she can Absolutely. clear it up for you. Okay, go ahead. You were, you were on a roll there. I just had to do I that. I want to just make it really clear because I know I get that it's a bit confusing. So um, a really common role that trauma survivors fall into in adulthood is parent role. So that they are the caregiver, the nurturer, the problem solver. The extreme version of that, which is what trauma survivors typically fall into, is people pleaser with no boundaries. What that means is, what that looks like, is they show up for everyone else all the time. They give, 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 and have no consideration for themselves, zero self-worth, so that why do I matter? Like, of course, I'm going to come and help you because what I've got isn't important. Like, they, what they see as important and valid is nothing within themselves and everything outside of themselves. So that's how they show up for the world. But it looks like the really good friend the really good colleague who always stays late and will always help you if you need them. The partner who will always support you. 
They'll give right. up their job if they need to help you. Like it's just an extreme degree of self-sacrifice. Being in that role is normally the parent role and a person can go overboard being in the parent role because of the trauma that they went through, the lack of love and attention and a number of other things that they went through. If they haven't done any work or they've done some and it hasn't been helpful, which is often or, the case. Or they've never been taught to do the work either, right? They've never, yeah. they never had yeah, a, a positive role model or somebody who was exemplary to show them. Uh, what else? Whatever skills they learned to survive their childhood, their brain has prioritized as like their manual for life. Okay. And this becomes the rule book in which you continue to live. So if you had to be a certain way, i.e. please your parents, appease the mood, not be a problem, not be a burden, not get in anybody's way, not be late, not hold anybody up, not ever have any needs or expectations on anyone that you're going to get your needs met because that was just too hard for people in your childhood. Yeah. You become an adult modeling that exact same rule book and showing up in that exact same way to the way you learn to get love, the way you got seen and heard and validated in any crumbs that you could get as a kid. You continue to use those same methods in all the relationships you have in adulthood. So you give, 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 give in relationships, you're self-sacrificing. Mm -hmm. and then you quite often people will try to love you like we talked about in the previous one and and you won't let them because you're like me yeah. Yeah. i'm not beautiful, i'm not I'm, I'm not i'm not worthy of it why are you giving this attention to me i've yeah. got too many flaws if you only yeah. knew the things that i've messed up before this is going to get messed up too all all these things come into play i'm comfortable loving not comfortable being loved that's yeah. just unbearable right um, that's one of the roles. And, and then what happens is when the focus is turned inward, so that's when the focus is outwards, right? When the focus is turned inward, we fall into child mode. And child mode is that helpless, disempowered, hopeless, mm -hmm. looking externally to be saved. It's kind of like how I see that princess in a tower. She's like, well, I'm just going to camp up here and wait for the prince to come and save me. Like, no, girl, get your boots on, get out of there. Like, like, but that's what I teach people. It's like, when you realize that's where you are at, most people, when I say this to them, when we have these sessions and we both focus on these roles, most people go, whoa, <laughs> I've been in child mode forever. And no wonder, like, my husband shows up for me in this way. And no wonder this happened. And wow I didn't even know that's what I was doing yeah and they're, they're like the gem moments because you're like okay this is where you are but you want to know how to get out I'm like yes so let's go two magic Wait, questions I want to I want to hear you do that voice again how'd you do that again do the whoa how'd you do it whoa. your voice went really deep <laughs> all right okay now I, you said helpless hopeless I wish you had another h there so helpless, then I can have the, I can make it the three H's and then we can go do another IGTV live. And we're just <laughs> helpless, hopeless. Come on, I said it disempowered. I know it was a good one too. I'm still yeah. using that. I'm using that too, but that's okay. We can go H. We can go. We can go HHD. So <laughs> disempowered. All right, go ahead. What else you got for me? Okay, so then we ask the two magic questions. Okay, and it's only two because you only need two. And the first one is, how do I feel? Mm -hmm. You might be like, wow, that's a bit of an anticlimax, Leon. Bear with me. No, no, no. That, that's good because <laughs> I know when you say something really simple, like a question, there's going to be like 5,000 words behind it. But go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Um, like we've talked about, often there's that disconnect between the body and the mind for trauma survivors. Being in mm -hmm. here was too hard, so they stayed here. Equally, being in our own bubble is too hard, so we focus externally, like I talked about in the parent mode. So what I teach people to do is gently, slowly start to turn their gaze inward. And it has to be gentle because for some people, they don't even feel they deserve that attention, not even from themselves. So it's such a build of, we're going to just gently try to focus in on our body. Okay. And there's heaps of ways we can do this. But one of the ways I teach people is just to ask the question, how do I feel? How do I feel right now? And that's, that has two components. One is physically and one is emotionally. So can I ask you to do that with me? Mm -hmm. How do you feel right now, Paxton? Um, I'm hungry. Okay. 
So oh, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Did you want me to do physical first? Any physical? You said a physical and emotionally, right? Jed, it doesn't matter. You got that, That's one. You're hungry. Second okay. one was for like emotional response. How do you feel emotionally right now? I'm very happy. Very happy. Yeah. Oh, wait. Very, very happy. <laughs> okay. Oh, why don't you no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Wait, what was I, supposed to, I can pick another one. No, no, that's how you feel. But the, the check-in is like, okay, so you in that moment, you really quickly checked in with your with your gut and you're like, my tummy, okay, I'm de definitely feeling like I need dinner right now because it's probably dinner time where you are. And uh, but, but my happiness outweighs my the outweighs my hunger. I, I'm just saying it. So your emotional experience right now. So the hormones it always, it always outweighs in. my my food, yeah. <laughs> if not, I'd be four hundred pounds. <laughs> You should be right there. <laughs> now, what am I supposed to say to that? <laughs> you look no. fantastic, though. It doesn't. Okay, go well, ahead. It's nothing to do with like weight. Right, it just right. food. Food is a big motivator. Okay. Um. Okay. So, turning that gaze inward, checking in with both your emotional state and your physical state, and for some people, ask a question. May I ask yeah. a question? Why those two? No other aspect, not mentally or anything else, spiritually or nothing else, or yeah, not just yet because we're okay. So just oh, physical, okay. yeah. So, but it's like physical and emotional. Mm -hmm. So, and we look with emotional. Some people do get quite deep and get spiritual. They might even get quite mental about it, um, as in cognitive. What I want to just hi highlight for people is um, when I say, "How do you feel?" So many people say, "I think." No, no, no. I didn't ask you what you think. I asked you how you feel. Mm -hmm. we're so quick to default back up here so when you're when how do i feel just watch out for the think response because okay. we don't want this you can you can absolutely check in with your thoughts that's fine but not in this exact moment i want you to connect to your body because when we're pulling ourselves when we're in child mode we know what we're thinking and it's usually bad it's usually negative it's usually full of self hatred and just it's not good it's so either in, it, you know it's, it's almost like it's it's either incorrect information or we don't have all the information we need when we're in child mode because what you're saying is we need to tap into the facts of how we feel not give in to what we thought or what someone instructs us that we think kind of let me get there so that's not like wrong or incorrect in any way, but just this has a method to it. So no, it's yeah. okay if I'm wrong because this is an audience of one. I get to have you teach me uh, as you're writing. This is the second question. Second the question. second question is what? What do I need? Do I need? So first question is how do I feel physically and emotionally? Second question is what do I need? So can I ask you that question? What do you need? I need more time. To do this with you so i'm sorry that's okay. literally the first thing that i need but your your feeling in the first question was you were hungry yeah but i food is going to be wherever it is when i get done so that's okay you don't have to do it right now but what i'm asking I have to you, chase it Go what ahead. do you what you need you feel like you need more time because i'm i'm piggybacking that off of the fact that i'm happy that i'm learning this so i need more time because i just looked at the clock and we were we're for like 56 minutes that we've been talking and I want more time, but go ahead. <laughs> that's okay, you, that's so literally okay. what I just went through in my head, but go ahead. And the next step is then go about doing something to meet one of those needs. Yes. So go actually do it, so take action. I, I actually did. I started trying to move you along to, to cram more in, but go ahead. <laughs> right, so when we, when we are assessing, how do yeah. I feel? We're turning the gaze back in on ourselves. We're checking in with our body, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. What do I need? Who asks you what you need? Who in your life or who in people's lives tend to say, what do you need? Well, that's a person in the parent role, more than likely, right. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kids don't tend to ask other kids, what do you need? It's the adults, right, who come in and say, what do mm -hmm. you need? So what you're starting to do is shift yourself. You're starting to shift yourself out of child mode and into adult mode. And there's an element of parent in there as well, but we're not gonna try and, we're not gonna jump too far. We're just gonna go into adult mode because that's where things feel a bit safer. Here is, we know this for other people. We're not ready to do this for ourselves quite often just yet. So 
Well, that's normally other people. We're not ready to go into that type of problem solving, nurturing, almost sometimes even over pleasing mode. We're just trying to get a balance of knowing what we feel and what we need. If I understand you correctly. Yeah. And then taking action to do just one thing, just start with just one thing. So if I give you an example from me, so if I say, what do I feel? What do I need? So I feel a bit tense because I'm excited. Um, I'm not, I ate my breakfast way too fast because I was like getting ready for this and then realized time difference were an hour late anyway. Um, it's okay, so I'm a bit, I'm a bit tense. I could do I'm a whole excited. show. I could do a whole show just on the time change in which you did before. For that. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and I ate my breakfast and I feel nice and full. So I don't really need anything in that respect. I'm kind of like got this hot, cold thing going on because we our air conditioning and our heat and I'm weird. Okay, so that's how I feel. What do I need? I'm actually quite hot at the moment and I probably need some water. So I might open a window and I might have a sip of water. So it's like a really simple in the moment exercise to be like, what's actually my experience right now? Let me just really mm -hmm. connect to the here and now. Remember we talked about how quite often we're stuck in the past or we're predicting the future negatively, right? Mm -hmm. We're very, very mm -hmm. rarely in the now. This brings you to now, right now. How am I? How am I feeling? What do I need? My goodness, I've never even considered my needs before that can be a real stumbling block for people. So that's why you start real simple, real small. What do I need? I have no idea. Some people are like, how, how do I even consider what I need? Okay, well, are you thirsty? I suppose, cool. So maybe you need some water? All right, I'll try that. Okay, go get yourself some water. And in that moment of actually reaching for the cup and taking that sip, you have nurtured yourself. You've done an act of care and love to yourself which pulls you out of child mode and into adult mode. This, is this similar to in the moment, reframing or rewiring? I, I, I'm just curious, is it, yeah. is it, is it, uh, I'm gonna jump ahead. Catch, cancel. No, right. it's not, it's no, not that. It's not that. That's the next thing I'm going to come to, but no, but so asking. it absolutely is rewiring because what you've just done in that moment, so if I use like myself in that, in that moment, if I'm not someone who's used to doing things like that for myself and I never pay attention to myself, when I then do that, I've just had a full body experience and a memory has been created and put away for me of that time I connected to my body, I identified a need and then I met that need myself. I did that for myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have a memory file of that time when I overcame that problem for myself. Mm -hmm. When I successfully navigated that moment of need for myself. Now imagine you stack them. Imagine that you do that. You start off with once a day. Start off with once a week if you have to, but you build up to multiple times a day. You check into yourself, set an alarm on your phone, wake up, lunch, bedtime. How am I feeling right now? Physically, emotionally, what do I need? Do I have a need? And then what can I do to meet that need? We are creating lived full body experiences, <clears throat> excuse me, of overcoming problems and solving them ourselves. How gorgeous is that for someone who got told they couldn't do anything right because they're stupid, for example. Right? It rewires because it gives the brain a new experience to choose from. If all you've ever known is that one thing, that program is pretty hardwired. And then you do this new thing. Yes, it's scary because new is scary, but you trust yourself to do it anyway. It's gentle, right? You start small. And then you start to build up this pattern of, oh, I have a need that's a bit bigger today, but I've been doing pretty well at meeting these small needs. This isn't conscious, by the way. This happens subconsciously. We don't actually have this conversation where we're like, oh, I've been meeting my needs quite well. Maybe I can do this one. It just happens. We're just like, well, okay. I think I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just try. Like normally I would call a friend and I would, I would cry on the phone to them for three hours about this text I got for, or didn't get or whatever. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to see if I can do this. I'm going to go for a walk because I feel like anxious and irritable. So my need is 
to move. I'm going to go meet that need for myself by going for a walk. Mm -hmm. And these things might sound like, but they're so important because they are the moments and we get those moments a trillion times a day if we pay attention to choose to show up differently for ourselves, prove to ourselves, to our programming, that we actually can do this. And that all those people that told us we couldn't and all the, th all the times I had this belief told to me that I am this, I am that, and I can't, and I can't, I can, because look what I just did. And then every time you have those wins, they stack and they stack and they stack. And gradually, the thoughts that we tell ourselves start to shift slightly away from, oh my God, I'm so stupid. I can't do this. Everybody hates me. I'm such a moron. Why am I even here? This mm -hmm. life is ridiculous and I hate it. To today wasn't actually too bad. I actually had a really nice walk today. Cool. That becomes the thing you remember from today because it's such a win. You have amazingly talked about things that my audience is just dying to hear that they are not a lost cause. Some of them mm -hmm. have described themselves that way. And then, you know, you, how many times can you tell somebody, no, don't say that about yourself. Uh, but this empowers them to look at it the way you're describing it, especially the two questions. The two questions. One, how do I feel? Two, what do I need? You are able to help somebody navigate if they want to change, because that's what you were talking about. Yeah. If they want to change, they can start by with these two questions in moving away from staying in a child mode yeah. and move, as it were, up to the adult role to a measured degree, not worrying about the parent role, really just trying to find some type of emotional and physical and mental equilibrium so that yeah. they know what they're dealing with but what is the catch cancel yeah Correct. so the other i'm sorry i'm being nosy but if you're going to do something else go right ahead but you you pick you know you pick my interest but go ahead yeah so it's it's a, another thought exercise so okay. in those moments where we have that negative internal monologue oh i'm such an idiot i can't believe i just said that oh my god did anybody hear me i can't believe i said that out loud or that those moments where we're, oh, and then we get to bed in, at night and we're like, oh, I can't believe I did that today. Uh, it's the anxious mind okay. reliving all the moments where we could have been rejected throughout the day. It's that need for connection and we feel like we sabotaged it because okay. that's our programming, right? So we have this like internal monologue that just basically hates on us. Wow. I call that punching yourself in the face because while you're talking about it in your head I just get, even when you said it i just can't imagine you said that you're such a nice person you just you call that punching yourself in the face yeah because people okay. don't understand the impact it has oh it's just a thought oh it's just in my head those anxious thoughts though are replaying themselves like you said like a monologue when a person goes to get in bed or they have a quiet moment they're disquieting thoughts and imagine, instead of just thinking them, while you're thinking them, you are punching yourself as hard as you can in your own face. Because that's what you're doing to yourself mm -hmm. when you have those thoughts. And also, while you're punching this up yourself in the face, what else can you possibly do in that moment? Like, can you, can you do, are you, can you attend to anything else? If your yeah. partner needs you in that moment, if your kid needs you in that if moment. If your child, right, or, or someone needs you, yeah. You're not going to be at your positive best. You're not, you're not, you are so punishing of yourself. You are pushing yourself so high down into the ground mm -hmm. that your belief in yourself is being squashed even further by your continuation to hate on yourself. Mm -hmm. So I have this framework of catch, cancel, correct. The moment you realize, because you can't do anything till you know, right so when that awareness happens and you're like oh i'm having those thoughts again first of all don't believe every stupid thing you think i actually don't like the word stupid in there because you know a lot of trauma survivors get called stupid so i don't like that so i often just say just don't believe everything you think so first of all it's just a thought and the way that you talk about that is say, oh i'm having a thought that mm -hmm. i'm having that thought again 
that I'm stupid. I'm having that thought again that nobody likes me. Okay, they're the thoughts that I'm having. There's a whole heap of exercises I do around this, but I'm gonna talk about just one today and it's catch, cancel, correct? I want you to physically imagine grabbing that thought midair, like someone's thrown it at you or you're Mm -hmm. throwing it out into the world. I'm stupid. I want you to imagine that you're catching it. Okay, so that's the first step. You say the word cancel out loud if you if you can if no one's around and you don't feel stupid for saying it out loud say hey we don't we don't feel stupid here remember that's we don't want to say that yeah right i I, sure so so you catch it you cancel it i often when i'm doing this for myself is i will literally i I literally do that so i will literally swipe in front of me and i'm all right gotcha cancel 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 until it just feels like it's gone like sometimes it can take just one, sometimes it's a persistent little thing and we'll wanna hang around. So you just like cancel, 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 cancel. Sometimes you can get more passionate and you're like, no, I've told you to cancel. <laughs> you can get like cancel, cancel, cancel. Got it. Got Whatever it. works, right? You're telling that thought to go away. You do not need it. It is un it is surplus to requirement. It's not welcome. Cancel. Okay. I got it. And then you correct it by inserting what you want to say instead. Now, you might not be ready to say something like, I'm amazing, I'm lovable, I'm truly worthy. You might not be there, and that's fine. If you are, go for it. If you're not, find something that is okay. What about, I tried really hard today. I did my best today. I did okay. I'm an okay person. Whatever, whatever feels bearable, because self-love for those who practice self-hate their whole lives feels so uncomfortable to the point of right. intolerable. Mm-hmm. So when we first start correcting our thoughts, it has to be bearable. So we have to be gentle with ourselves. You can't stand in the mirror shouting, I love myself, I'm beautiful, I'm enough. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, we have to mean. start where we're at, meet ourselves where we are, and then we practice this. This becomes an, a toolbox that we can, a tool in our toolbox that we can pull out whenever we need it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to run out of ink because I'm taking so many notes for you, but I appreciate that. Wait, that's why I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> because you're making me happy. All right. What else you got for me, my friend? And then one more skill that I teach people um, is the mind body grounding. Um, that's where we incorporate it's an, another skill to bring us into the present to pull us out of the past, future, in the here and now. And it's a really common one. Lots of people, if you've been in therapy, might have already experienced this, but I just adore this. It's so powerful. And it's five, four, three, two, one. So what we do is we do five things we can see. Four things we can hear. This is the mind and body grounding aspect? Yeah. Got it. So we've got five things we can see, four things we can hear, three things we can touch, one thing we can taste, and, oh, sorry, two things we can taste and one thing we can smell. It doesn't have to be that order. I just find that if you start with C, you can always see more things than you can taste, for example. Got it. Um, why this works so well, because while you're doing this, you can't do anything else. So if you were on that little hamster wheel of self-hatred, punching yourself in the face and you say, stop that, Mm -hmm. catch cancel correct, or you don't even want to do catch cancel correct. You just want to calm yourself down. Right. Stop saying I'm stupid and stop right at this moment. And just, I mean, do it with me. Five things you can see, Paxton. Oh, that was, that's kind of hard because I'm looking at the number five, four, three, two, no, I'm just kidding. I won't do that to you. Let's go like five things. I see, I see the number five, four, three. Okay. So your room. we're going to, we're going to go with, oh, I, I see them all. I'm a father. I have eyes on the side of my head. So we've got monitor here. Okay. We have a light over here. 
and we have a phone over here and a phone over here and a stack of papers here. Can I keep going? That's five. Four things you can hear. Well, of You're course I can, I can hear. Like I can any? hear my. I can hear my voice. Yeah. I, I can hear your voice. Yeah. I can hear my voice. <laughs> and then I can hear your voice. Okay, you uh, kind of set you up because you're in a booth, so you probably can't I'm just hear. Saying, I'm sorry. Three things you can touch. Um, my ear. Yep. My nose. Your headphones and your nose. No, no, no. My my ear. Okay. I want. I don't want to touch my headphones. And All my right. nose. Yep. And my chin. Let's do two things you can smell. Anyway. Oh, what? What? You skip. The two, two things I can taste, we can do that. Okay, yep, two things you can taste. Okay, you sure you're ready for this? This is really complicated. Water. Yeah. Okay, and one more thing. Yeah. Water. Twice. Normally people say things like the last thing they ate, but okay. <laughs> and then one thing you can Interesting. smell. Interesting, I would never. One thing that I can smell? Yeah. I can smell the water. The water, okay. So in that probably took you yeah, I love wow. the expression, expression on your face. You're like, this is the most difficult five more than it's doing ever. Okay, go ahead. Uh, that took you about 45 seconds to do that. And in those 45 seconds, were you able to think of anything else? I hate to say this. Yes, I was. Yeah? How often yeah, I was, in that I was thinking about eating, actually, because we started talking about it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's okay. Well, in 45 seconds, uh, I couldn't think of anything that we were actually doing um, at so present, is, we were talking right, about. So In other words, is, what we're doing right now. But go ahead. It refocuses you. It pulls your attention away from the self hatred monologue that we were playing, or whatever it was you were doing. It pulls you away from that and brings you to the here and now. And this it also, is something that can be used no matter what. Yeah. Anytime. Anytime you just feel like you're lost in your own head, the world's becoming a bit overwhelming you're thinking about the past or the future, stressing, whatever. If you want to bring yourself back to your body in a really gentle way, connecting with your five senses is a really gentle way to reconnect your mind and your body together in the moment. 